club. All right, here we go. Okay, uh, it's now 12 noon, and uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar about herbicide resistant weeds, which are a persistent problem for crop production. My name is Lee Bridgman. I'm a program assistant in Queen Anne's County, Maryland, and I'm going to be facilitating this session for you. Throughout the presentation, we'll use the chat pod for questions. So if you uh, use the down arrow to select everyone uh, and type your question in, the presenter will answer your question as soon as they're able. Just to remind you, the next webinar on August 24th will be on farm stress management and resiliency. Uh, and again, I wanna remind everyone that our presentation will be recorded today. You'll get an email uh, which will be sent directly to you with a link to the recording and any materials that are presented. Feel free to share this email with your colleagues. The complete collection of archived webinars can be found on our website. And I'm gonna share that link with you guys um, after we get started. Uh, I would like to now turn the presentation over to Kurt Vollmer to speak about herbicide resistant weeds. All right, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, Lee, can you, Lee, can you hear me? Wrong button. Yes, I can hear you good. Okay, just make, <laughs> making sure. I yeah, give a whole you. webinar without anybody actually hearing anything. <laughs> All right. All right, well, thank you everybody for having me today. Um, my name is Kurt Vollmer. I am the Extension Weed Management Specialist with the University of Maryland. I basically help um, growers manage weeds in a variety of crops, corn, soybean. I do a lot of vegetable work. I even answer questions about pasture weed management on occasion. So today's webinar is going to, I'm going to kind of teach you a little bit about what herbicide resistance is, um, how herbicides, uh, some basic information about how herbicides work in plants, and how we can use all of the, this information to kind of adapt our own individual weed management programs. So for the, so the outline of this talk is basically gonna start with, you know, what are herbicides and how do they work? What is herbicide resistance? The different types of herbicide resistance mechanisms, and again, adapting these to your weed management program. Well, first, starting with, well, how, how herbicides work. What exactly do they do? They do? Well, all herbicides primarily work um, by inhibiting a specific process in a plant that in interferes with its ability to grow and develop. For example, a lot of the herbicides we use kill plants by inhibiting a particular enzyme, which causes a buildup of toxic substances in the plant. Um, this figure here shows under normal conditions, what you have is a simplified version of a biological process. You have an a substrate binding to an enzyme, which allows for the production of amino acids. Herbicides work by actually binding to a site on the enzyme different from where the substrate binds. That effectively simply just blocks or prevents the substrate from binding to that to the site it needs to. If that substrate can't bind, then there's no biolog the biological process does not continue. There's, for example, there's no, no amino acid production, and that plant dies. Now, all herbicides are classified into groups according to their site of, action, site of action. And this is the site of action is actually how herbicides or the specific biological process a herbicide affects. It may affect a particular enzyme uh, um, such as the ALS enzyme, which is responsible for producing um, branch chain amino acids in plants. It can also affect photosynthesis. It can affect, you know, how cell membranes are developed, are produced in plants. It can affect how um, carotenoid production in plants. 
Um, and the Weed Science Society of America has classified all of these different herbicide sites of action into uh, about 27 different herbicide groups. And, that, and that, that's the number you see here on your screen. So each herbicide site of action will be given a specific group number. And that's really gonna be important later on when we talk about managing herbicides for resistance. I also wanna point out that this group number can also be found on many of the herbicide labels you'll read. For example, Reflex here um, says it's a group 14 herbicide. And certain and other herbicides may actually have more than one herbicide group. Um, for example, Lumax here, we have a group, is a combination of a group 15 herbicide, a group five herbicide, and a group 27 herbicides. So these herbicide groups, uh, refer to, again, exactly what type of binding site, what specific biological process um, this herbicide affects. But what does that look like? So how do herbicides affect plants? Well, when you spray a herbicide, um, susceptible plants are going to display different symptomologies depending on what, what um, herbicide's been sprayed. For example, if you're spraying a herbicide that's a a photosynthetic inhibitor. A lot of times what you'll see is this kind of type of chlorosis and bleaching along the leaf margins. However, a herbicide like an ALS inhibitor is gonna display completely different symptoms. A lot of times you'll kind of see uh, red veins start to develop. Uh, carotenoid inhibiting herbicides, also known as bleacher. Bleachers are uh, gonna turn tissue white Oxen mimics like dicamba and 2,4-D, you're kind of going to see this twisted uh, growth, kind of twisted leaves, stems, and especially this type of uh, leaf cupping from uh, dicamba treatments. So now on to herbicide resistance. Well, how this diagram is going to a good example of you know what happens in the field. How how do we end up from having no resistant weeds in a field to having a field full of resistant weeds. Well, herbicide resistance occurs when a single herbicide or herbicide group, such as like an ALS inhibitor, a group two herbicide, or something like glyphosate is used exclusively for weed control. That say that herbicide has been sprayed over and over for years. Now, when you do that, you're actually going to select for a resistant individual. So say so you spray that herbicide side and you notice, okay, there's one individual plant that survives that herbicide application. Now that individual plant is naturally resistant to that herbicide and it's able to survive and reproduce. As you keep spraying that herbicide over and over, what you do is you're going to select for that resistant individual. And over time, you're going to kill off more and more of the susceptible varieties, but you're still going to leave that um, resistant uh, biotype in the field. Keep doing that same thing over and over, spraying the same thing. And eventually what you're left with in your field is all of those resistant biotypes. Now, some basic principles of herbicide resistance. This is something that's a result of naturally occurring processes. Now, her these herbicide resistant biotypes are naturally present in the field. Um, plants have polyploid genotypes, which makes um, means they have a lot of genotypic variation. What herbicides do not do is mutate plants. Um, rem it's remember that you know phenotypic um, traits are acquired during a subject's lifetime aren't necessarily passed on to an individual's offspring. Think about um, having peer steers. A lot of you probably have peer steers. But were your children born with peer steers? No, they weren't. So we talk about herbicide and developing herbicide resistance, and we're talking about the, a naturally resistant biotype growing and reproducing and those traits being 
passed down. Resistance is heritable and, and it does pass from one generation to the next. But it's also important to remember that we control failures are not automatically due to a weed being herbicide resistant. Brings me to the next subject of herbicide tolerance. Now this is the inherent ability of a species to survive and reproduce after herbicide treatments. This implies that there was no selection pressure or genetic man manipulation to make that plant tolerant. It's just naturally tolerant. When we see tolerance with weeds and, and other plants, um, we see selected, a lot of times we'll see selectivity based on herbicides because you know that crop is tolerant to a particular herbicides. There's a particular class of herbicides called the ACCase inhibitors. And those herbicides are really only effective on grasses. And if I were to spray one of those herbicides on a broadleaf plant, such as a morning glory, I wouldn't expect that morning glory to be resistant to that ACCase herbicide. And you know, some herbicides are really, again, only effective on some weeds. Um, weeds like uh, herbicides like 2,4-D are only effective on broadleaf weeds, and they're not going to and won't touch grasses. But herbicide tolerance, again, herbicide tolerance is not synonymous with herbicide resistance. By definition, if a weed has never been controlled and there's been no change in the weed's population, lack of response to a herbicide over time, again, that population will be tolerant. Again, important things to, to note when you're planning your weed control program, um, if you look on a particular herbicide label and you don't necessarily find a weed, um, that could indicate that, you know, that herbicide just isn't effective on that particular species. Uh, a lot of, um, another way um, herbicides can be tolerated or most or more likely crops can to tolerate herbicide is through different application timings. And it's important to remember that herbicides can be applied either pre-emergence. Um, this is what happens when you apply a herbicide before a crop emerges. Um, pre-emergence applications will kill weeds shortly after they germinate or emerge to the soil surface. Um, pre-emergence herbicides are generally taken up by the soil roots and shoots and move throughout the xylem of a plant. Post-emergence herbicides are the herbicides we apply after those plants have emerged, after we see the, after we can see them. Um, most of the time, these herbicides are applied to the leaves and absorbed through foliar tissue. However, so, some, uh, some pre-emergence or soil active or residual herbicides and post-emergence herbicides will have both um, soil activity and foliar activity, but you know the pre-emergence herbicides are going to have that higher degree of soil activity. So now I just want to talk about uh, herbicide selectivity with you know those soil active, those pre-emergence herbicides. And that a lot of a lot of that has to do with the application timing and where the herbicide is placed. Another thing that's important to remember is that herbicide must reach the treated zone to be effective. So what do I mean by treated zone? So after, um, so in our soil profile, we have our weeds, our grass weeds and our pigweed species generally concentrated to, at the, uh, closer to the soil surface. Then we'll have, you know, our crops like our soybeans, corn, buried a little bit deeper. After they're planted and we spray our herbicide, that herbicide layer is gonna be left on top of the soil. It will actually need a, an irrigation or type of, or a rainfall event to actually get into what I call the treated zone. So once the, the herbicide leaches into that treated zone, uh, these weed seeds, they're actually going to grow and they're going to take up that, that herbicide, which is eventually going to kill them. However, because of the placement in the soil, the crop seeds, when they start to germinate, 
they will actually grow through that treated zone and have no issues. Um, another term about, uh, more about herbicide selectivity with um, post-emergence herbicides, um, uh, placement and just actually physically keeping that herbicide away from your crop and potentially away from the weeds you wanna treat. One of, the, uh, one of these methods is to use like a shielded sprayer. Here's an example of a shielded sprayer being used to apply uh, germoxone treatments in watermelon. Notice that we have the watermelon uh, crop in between the tractor here and those shields on each side spraying, making sure that that herbicide does not come in contact with the plant. Again, another mechanism of herbicide selectivity is going to be a metabolism. Um, some herbicides may work on some species, but not on others. Another mechanism of herbicide selectivity is going to be the growth stage. Um, a lot of those pre-emergent soil residual herbicides are not going to be effective on controlling weeds once they emerge. However, most post-herbicides will be on effective on we weeds after they're up. There's also the issue of having small weeds versus large weeds. Um, a lot of herbicides will only work well when weeds are less than three inches tall, regardless of their, whether they're resistant or not. As weeds grow larger, the less effective that a herbicide is going to be. So what will this herbicide uh, resistance actually look like in your field? What, what are you first going to see or notice that may uh, lead you to suspect that you have a herbicide resistant weed? Well, first of all, you're going to see um, that her a particular herbicide you've used over several years and you start to notice kind of a weed control failure of this species um, when, you've, uh, when, you, when it's been controlled uh, by the same herbicide year after year. Another thing you will start to notice is that same species, that's going to start to spread when, it start, when it's not really being controlled. Because again, you're selecting for that herbicide resistant species by killing off all the susceptible species and all the, all the other susceptible weeds. But another, the last thing you'll probably really start to notice is you'll no notice that some of the plants you sprayed with this particular herbicide, say Roundup, died, and then some of them did not die. And this is a good uh, example of you know, what herbicide resistance is gonna initially look like in the field, because when you first notice it, um, there will still be some susceptible plants. You know, not all the plants in your field are gonna be herbicide resistant right away. You see you know, intermixed um, dead and alive species, uh, plants of the same species. For example, this would be an example, this would be uh, resistant horseweed uh, along with susceptible ho horseweed uh, sprayed with glyphosate. Notice that we have plenty of dead plants in the field, but also a lot of surviving plants. So not all, it's not always that simple when you have herbicide resistance resistant weeds. You, we, again, you will have some susceptible species and you will have some um, resistant species. So there are actually many types of herbicide resistance out there. There is single herbicide resistance where that particular weed will be resist to only one herbicide mode of action, herbicide side of action. There can also be cross resistance where it's resistant to two or more herbicide families in the same site of action. This would be something like a herbicide is resistant to an ALS inhibiting inhibitor within that family of ALS inhibiting herbicides. We have herbicides like Raptor and herbicides like Synchrony. They both, they're both have different chemical uh, compositions, they belong to the same family. And 
therefore have that single resistance mechanism. There's also multiple herbicide resistance, which is uh, most concerning for us because that is when a weed becomes resistant to two or more herbicide sites of action, two or more different herbicide groups. So it's resistant to you know, not only that group one herbicide that affects the amino acid production, but also may be resistant to that group 27 herbicide that affects carotenoid biosynthesis. So essentially that's two different herbicides that are no longer useful for controlling that weed. And I will say that herbicide resistance is increasing. Uh, this map on the left shows the number of herbicide resistant biotypes um, currently in the world. Um, and the United States has about 127 uniquely herbicide uh, resistant weeds. Um, over time, we are seeing an increase in herbicide res resistant weeds from about 1975, um, a consistent e increase up until about 2020 and today. And a lot of that uh, increase in herbicide resistance is again attributed to using the same herbicide over and over and over. Uh, what has happened in the past is once a weed has been, become resistant to one herbicide, um, we've expected to, to have another herbicide to take, it take its place and provide us those same weed control benefits. And that's what we call a silver bullet. And unfortunately, there are no silver bullets when it comes to herbicides. You're not gonna have one herbicide that's, that's in the already developed or in the pipeline that's gonna be available to control everything in a sustainable manner. So going back to different herbicide mechan uh, actual mechanisms of resistance, and these are how the herbicides are going to talk uh, the actual physiological me mechanism of how a herbicide will uh, a resistant uh, weed will tolerate a herbicide. One of these is through an altered target site. Um, this means that somehow that binding site. Um, on the protein changes so the herbicide can't bind. Another would be overexpression of the target protein or what we call gene amplification. This means that too much of that target enzyme is um, produced and there's not enough herbicide to bind to those target sites. Compartmentalism or sequestration. This simply means that the plant somehow restricts that her that's herbicide movement in the cell so that herbicide doesn't actually reach the site where it needs to be effective. And finally, there is enhanced metabolism where this herbicide is modified into a non-toxic molecule or it's kind of moved out of the cell. So going back to um, that uh, classic target site mutation, going back to the example I showed earlier of this kind of um, lock and key molecule where you had that substrate binding to the enzyme, which allows for uh, th the production of those essential amino acids. Again, that herbicide, that's going to bind to that substrate or that enzyme and prevent the substrate from binding so that amino acid can't be produced. What happens with herbicide resistance, again, is that target site is actually changed on that enzyme. So that herbicide cannot bind, but notice that the target site for the substrate has not changed. That substrate is still able to bind in that plant. Amino acids are produced and that plant is able to live. And that's classic target site mutation. Now, when we talk about gene amplification, again, that's when you have too much of a particular uh, gene, for example, here we have the EPA, ESPS synthase gene, which is responsible for production of another type of amino acid. Now, generally, when you spray a plant with glyphosate, there are enough uh, 
there's enough glyphosate, glyphosate molecules and enough EPSP synthase binding sites for that glyphosate molecule to attach to. But with gene amplification, what occurs is there's simply too many EPSP synthase binding sites and not, not enough glyphosate molecules. So eventually, so there, ergo, the uh, weed is able to produce those essential amino acids, uh, acids it needs to survive. Uh, Non-target site resistance, again, this will be something like sequestration or compartmentalization. This is simply, uh, you have that, you have a herbicide, uh, there's reduced translocation, it can't get to where it needs to go, and it's transported directly in the vacuole where it's again sequestered and detoxified. Now, metabolic resistance is something that allows a weed to rapidly degrade an herbicide. Um, this mechanism is also why Crops can be treated and no injury is observed. A lot of uh, crops are, have na uh, are naturally metabolic resistant to certain herbicides. Some of that metabolic resistance has actually been uh, bred into them. It's also why um, we can detoxify a lot of toxic substances because they can be metabolized in our bodies. Now, typically metabolic resistance, this is what we can be described in a three phase process. So you have your herbicide here. Now, phase one involves some type of modification, slight modification of the herbicide mole molecule, which pre predisposes it to further mod modification. Phase two involves uh, combining that modified herbicide with another her compound, such as a sugar that facilitates that, that final step. Now, phase three involves um, transport enzymes that move the herbicide into the cell wall, into the vac something like a vacuole, which is pretty much described as a cell's garbage can or outside into intracellular space. Um, the movement of that herbicide to these areas, again, isolates that herbicide from the target site so it's no longer a threat to the plant. And each of these phases is actually mediated by a particular enzyme. For example, the phytochrome P450, GST, and ABC transport enzymes. However, uh, plants typically have multiple versions of these enzymes and having multiple versions of these enzymes also means that the plant may able, be able to metabolize more than one type of herbicide or herbicide group. So when we talk about metabolic resistance, um, again, I want to discuss how it can occur. So, when applied at very low doses, say a half X rate of your, nor of your normal herbicide, there can be some individual plants that will actually survive. These plants will actually possess sufficient capacity to metabolize that herbicide to where they're no longer a threat. And this leads us to what we call the phenomenon of creeping resistance. These lower herbicide doses allow plants with these minor resistance genes to survive. And this provides the genetic material for future herbicide resistant biotypes, which can be enriched through uh, cross-pollination within a population. Now, for example, a study in Australia found that using redu reduced rates of the herbicide holon resulted in biotypes that were 50 times more resistant within three generations. And these lower herbicide rates may be attributed to you know, deliberately cutting the rate, uh, trying to do, do cost cutting measures, antagonistic tank mixtures with the herbicide, spraying of older or larger plants, 
or spraying the plants under stressful conditions. Now, as I mentioned before, um, having all these different uh, herbicide resistance re me metabolic enzymes can actually lead to multiple resistance. Now, multiple resistance can occur when certain, certain enzymes, such as cytochrome P450, display increased metabolism. This not only allows that biotype to metabolize one herbicide group, but other groups as well. And it, this is just due to that, those different versions of that particular enzyme. So from a management standpoint, when we're talking about herbicide resistant weeds, uh, the weeds we are most concerned with right now in Maryland are Italian ryegrass, horseweed or mare's tail, common ragweed, and palmer amaranth. And all of these species have displayed multiple resistance. Italian ryegrass resistant and common ragweed resistant to up to three herbic different herbicide groups. Uh, Mare's tail and palmer amaranth are uh, currently resistant to two herbicide groups in Maryland. And, we, and with these herbicide resistant weeds and these weeds being our kind of our driver species for management, we need to think about different things we can do to manage these weeds and help to prevent other weeds from um, developing herbicide resistance as well. So for the next part of the program, I'm going to talk about adapting your weed, how to adapt and use um, an integrated weed management program. Now, integrated weed management program, um, this involves what we call using many li little hammers, using different tactics um, to control weeds or manage weeds so, because so weeds don't get used or adapt to a, a single uh, weed management strategy such as a chemical strategy of spraying glyphosate year after year. These tactics can involve, include chemical tactics like herbicide, but also cultural tactics, mechanical tactics, and even preventative tactics. And weed management is going to start with prevention. Um, ways to keep the, these weeds out of your field um, before they cause a problem. The key to prevention is to start the season clean, whether you use tillage or you're using a burn down herbicide application. Um, weeds are, uh, crops are most susceptible to yield loss from weeds early in the, early in the growing season. Um, if you have, if you, plant into a weedy field uh, where the weeds have already become established, you're going to see significant yield loss if, you, if the weeds are actively competing with the crop and you do nothing after you plant, you're going to see yield loss. More so early in the season, if you have a few weeds come up later in the season, it's not so much of a problem. So be sure to start, uh, start that season clean. Also a good preventative measure is to scout your fields early and often. Um, you wanna scout your fields before you plant, see, see what's there, see what you might need to control. If you're using a herbicide program, you wanna scout your fields um, at least one to two weeks after that herbicide application is made to make sure it's still working to control these weeds. And you also want to ID these weed species to develop specific treatments. Because um, like uh, with different herbicides, you know, the same herbicides aren't always going to control the same weeds. So it's important to know, you know, what's in your field? What do I need to control um, with this particular herbicide? What can I control with this particular herbicide? Um, some good weed ID sources, uh, many available. Um, there's a book called Weeds of the Northeast that I use all the time, um, Flora of the Northeast. A lot of herb, uh, weed information is available online. Another good resource I use is this ID Weeds app from the University of Missouri. We also have several other different apps that are available 
Um, just, you know, go look for search weed ID apps on your uh, Google or Apple Play Store and you'll, and you'll find something. Um, cultural cultural uh, weed management tactics after you've looked at the you know, best way to prevent weeds, um, it's going to be any tactic that creates a competitive advantage for a crop. This can involve using things like cover crops, adjusting your crop seeding density, your row spacing, adjusting your planting date, or you know just rotating different crops. Now, crop rotation is probably the easiest form of cultural weed management. You know, you're just simply rotating one uh, crop to the next. So for example, corn to soybeans, corn to soybeans to wheat, et cetera. You know, we've seen many benefits over, of crop rotation over the years, um, one of them being um, reduced disease susceptibility of different crops when you rotate from a grass crop to a broadleaf crop. Some of the pros for using it for weed management, however, you know, have to deal with you know, these different planting and harvesting dates. Depending on what weed species you have, you know, some may emerge with the crop, some may emerge right after you plant the crop. Crop rotation also allows us, you know, different competitive ability based on, you know, crop and weed maturity, how fast that crop grows, how fast the weeds grow, um, different fertility re regimes, um, water, and different herbicide programs. The drawbacks of crop rotation being sometimes that in the environment isn't always practical for you to rotate crops. For example, you, know, you probably need a little bit more water with corn than you would be for soybean. And if you have a dry land area, that might not necessarily be suitable for rotating a corn crop after a soybean crop. Also, what we uh, one of the problems we have this year is you know high input costs. You know, corn needs nitrogen. Are you? If you can't afford to put uh, nitrogen on your corn, then you might have decided to plant soybeans. And just going back to this concept of adjusting your planting date and your being able to adjust your planting date in your crop rotation, um, just remember rapid and even emergence of a crop is critical to vigor and competitive ability. For example, um, early planted corn is much more competitive with Palmer amaranth and smooth pigweed than later planted corn. In this example here, uh, common ragweed is actually one of the first um, summer annual weeds to emerge. And it's generally more of a problem with corn rather than than soybean because corn is planted you know, right around the 1st of April, right when that ragweed is starting to germinate. If you could plant corn earlier, you'll actually get some corn, you know, that crop canopy up, um, taller corn way before that common ragweed starts to emerge and give that corn a little bit more of a competitive advantage. However, uh, this planting date strategy doesn't always work with every weed. Now corn has, you know, a germination period of about April to July. A weed like Palmer amaranth actually has a single, a season long germination period from about April all the way through October. So a strategy of planting, you know, corn to, to manage Palmer amaranth is still viable for um, both common ragweed and more so for Palmer amaranth because you know that corn is going to be planted earlier. Um, it's going to be up fast. It's going to be up before the Palmer amaranth starts to take take off. Whereas if you look at planting date for soybeans, you no know, soybeans are planted towards the end of June, uh, end of May, end of June, right when that Palmer is going to be more competitive with those soybean crops.
So pros for planting date, again, adjusting that uh, date to prevent the weed establishment. Gets, get, the, get the crop ins before the weeds emerged. The con, you know, again, overall weed germination doesn't always correspond to this planting date, especially when you're dealing with something like uh, Palmer Amory. Um, cover crops. This is an integrated uh, tactic that I've uh, seen good results for over several years. You know, cover crops suppress weeds through uh, the actual phys uh, competition um, as they grow, primarily competing with those winter annual weeds. Um, it leads to you know, reduced numbers, heights, and densities of these winter annual weeds as it's competing. It also leads to shading of that soil surface. A lot of the herbicide resistant weeds we're concerned with now, such as Palmer amaranth, don't tolerate light well. So if you have something on top of the soil to shade, shade out that light, then um, it's not gonna germinate. Um, there's also the result, these heavy mulch will also provide some physical suppression of weeds and certain species will actually provide allelopathy where they will, these cover crops will actually release kind of toxic compounds that will prevent weeds from emerging. Now pros of cover crops, they're again, they're both effective on winter and summer annual weeds like mare's tail, uh, like palmer amaranth. However, cover crops aren't as effective against perennial weeds. Remember, perennial weeds are those weeds that are going to emerge from structures like underground tubers or underground rhizomes. Um, they're able to emerge from deeper within that soil surface and grow through that cover crop mulch. And the effectiveness of these cover crops really depends on things like how you manage it. Um, cover crops need to be ma managed for uh, biomass production. It also depends on what species you use and your planting date. And cover crops, unfortunately, also require uh, specialized equipment, you know, not necessarily always to plant the cover crop, but definitely to plant um, your actual cash crop into that field. So again, it's important to remember that you know, not all cover crops are equal. Um, when we talk about managing cover crops for weed control, we're primarily looking at cover crops that are going to produce a high amount of biomass, but also cover crops that are going to have a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio that are going to provide some suppression into that summer growing season, cover crops that are going to have that kind of high carbon nitrogen ratio and that high fiber content. For example, we have two cover crops here. This at the top of the screen is a cereal rye cover crop. And below that we have a hairy vetch cover crop. Now I'll say both of these cover crops were planted in the late fall. And we can see that you no, know, they they've grown, they're grown and they've established and they produce a significant amount of uh, biomass. However, when it comes time to plant, these cover crops need to be terminated. And a cover crop like hairy vetch, it's, that's primarily leaf tissue and a little bit of stem tissue, that biomass is actually going to degrade a few weeks after it's terminated and no longer have a mulch layer or a suppressive layer to prevent you know, further germination of winter annual weed species. Whereas with a cereal rye cover crop, you terminate that late, say about two weeks before planting, there's gonna be a lot of lignified tissue, a lot of stem tissue with a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's gonna allow that cover crop residue to remain on that soil surface as a mulch throughout the rest of the growing season. And I, min and I just mentioned the word mulch, and that is basically a similar form of using a type of cover, where, whether it be, you know, your standard, you know, wood chip mulch for your gardens or a plastic mulch, which you'd use 
um, in between the rows of vegetables like um, watermelons, tomatoes, peppers, etc. Like the you know, traditional cover crops, um, these mulches help to exclude, exclude light, uh, preventing you know, these smaller seeded weeds from germinating. And it also, these mulches also help to regulate soil temperatures. So if a particular weed species needs you know, warmer temperatures to germinate, you know, that mulch is gonna keep it cool for a while um, to prevent it from coming up and giving those crop plants a competitive advantage. Drawbacks of mulches, you know, especially plastic mulch, it's limited to transplants or specialized seeding. Um, plastic mulch um, requires specialized irrigation. Um, mulch isn't the best thing for control of perennial weeds, and especially uh, weeds like yellow nut, nut sedge. I challenge any of you who are growing plastic vegetables not to find a yellow nut sedge plant popping up through that plastic. And there's also the issue of, you know, what do we do and how do we properly dispose of that plastic? I just wanted to mention quickly the next uh, cultural tactic of crop seeding density. You know, pro for that is you increase the crop population and improve its the competitive ability of that crop. The con being, um, you know, competition between those crop plants, you know, that intraspecific competition where you have too much of the crop and it just doesn't grow as well as it could be with just, you know, a, a few plants in the field. Um, reduced row spacing, another good cultural tactic, especially when we're looking at uh, weed management in soybeans. Now I mentioned how mulch and cover crops work by helping to exclude light. Now by reducing your weed uh, row spacing in soybeans from say 30 inch rows to 15 inch rows, you actually allow that crop canopy to, to develop a lot faster. And notice that those 15 inch rows, they're actually covering all that bare space in the soil. And without any, with no light able to reach that soil surface, um, those uh, weeds aren't going to germinate and you're, and you're going to see um, better weed control in your field. Now, reduce weed spacing not only leads to fast, that faster canopy closure, but for weeds like Palmer amaranth, that reduced row spacing can also lead to <clears throat> a decrease in the number of seed that is produced um, in the plant. For example, on the right-hand side of your screen, this is a Palmer amaranth plant from a soybean field that was planted in 30-inch rows. In the middle, you have a Palmer amaranth plant that was planted in 15 inch rows. And on the left side or is seven inch rows. So even though this Palmer amaranth plant produced seed, we're actually seeing a much lower uh, biomass of the, of the weed and uh, fewer seed heads. Another cultural tactic um, being fertilization. This means, you know, that Remember that weeds can use uh, soil nutrients to these to their advantage. And if a lot of times, if you're just broadcasting fertilizer, um, the weeds might take it up before the crop. For example, you know, wild oats will take advantage of nitrogen application much earlier than wheat. And again, the type of fertility will favor a weed infestation. For example. Um, if you have uh, low nitrogen in your fields, you'll start to see more leguminous weeds. If you have high nitrogen in your fields, you'll start to see uh, the presence of weeds such as annual bluegrass. So that's a uh, fertility is a good indicator of what type of uh, weed and weed problem you may have. Uh, for fertilization, it just and weed management, it's just, again, important to remember those four R's. You wanna do the right source, what's, what's the fertilizer you need for your crop needs, um, the right rate for your crop needs, you know, the right time. Um, when 
when are those nutrients available for when that crop needs it needs them and placement. Uh, try to uh, keep those nutrients in the rows or as close to the crop as possible so you're not actually feeding the weeds. The next type of integrated weed management tactic is actually mechanical. And this is gonna be any tactic that physically removes or suppresses weeds. Um, some people actually have cover crops and mulches in mechanical weed control. And they're kind of a, uh, a bridge um, tactic. But for mechanical, most of us think of, you know, using a tractor or using a hoe, hand weeding, hoeing, you know, cultivation. This also involves thermal or electrical control and can involve, again, can involve mulch. You know, hand weeding, hoeing, um, a tactic that's been used over the past, you know, 5,000 years or so. The pros being, you know, hand weeding is very precise. Even though you might not be able to tell or identify a weed in your field, you can definitely tell that it's not part of the crop. So therefore, you know, it's highly effective. You know, the con being, you know, it's expensive. You know, this is an old estimate, probably about $500 to $900 an acre for labor. I'm sure it's, the cost has gone up. Yeah, you know, mowing, um, um, uh, those weeds, you know, pros of mowing, um, you're actually selectively removing those apical marrow stems so it can't grow. Um, Mow, it or mow plants early enough, you help to eliminate seed production. Um, if you're mowing perennial plants, it helps to deplete the nu nutrient reserves in those underground tissues, those underground bulbs, those underground rhizomes. Now the cons, a lot of times when you mow, it allows grasses to outcompete with broadleaf weeds because with grasses, remember that growing point, that apical meristems, that, that's below the, the ground, so that's not being touched. So that, so the grasses are able to grow back. You know, perennial weeds, even though mowing will deplete the nutrient reserves, um, they require a lot more mowing to actually kill the plant. And when you're mowing, just be aware that uh, the frequency of mowing and that cutting height are, are critical. Again, back to the example of, of mowing perennial weeds and depleting those nutrient reserves. Um, when you talk about um, pasture weed management in particular. Um, if, you mow, if you mow too low, um, actually kind of scalping your um, forage crop and you're allowing more, giving that those weeds a competitive advantage by allowing more light to, weed, to reach that soil surface. Whereas if you just, you know, raise your mower bar a little bit higher, you cut, you cut off those broadleaf weeds and your, and your other weeds of concern and while still allowing for that um, cut, that um, forage crop to grow and develop. Um, cultivation and tillage, you know, running a plow or a disc through your, your, your field um, to manage weeds, especially before planting, you know, this really helps to you know, break some of those weeds apart. It pulls them from the soil. It does help to desiccate some of the seed by bringing it up to the sur soil surface where it dries out a lot faster. It will disrupt those food reserves in those perennial weeds. And it will serve to bury some of that seed in the soil profile. Now the con being, you know, tillage, constant tillage, it does reintroduce weed seeds. So even though you bury its weed seed uh, one year in the soil surface, you till the field again, that same weed seed emerges the next year. Tillage can stimulate weed seed germination, and it can be both a good thing and a bad thing. One of the good things about tillage stimulating weed seed germination is you till once, you might get a, a, a flush of a, a particular weed species that then you can then manage again with a uh, second tillage pass or even a her herbicide treatment. Unfortunately, tillage will spread uh, reproductive structures of uh, perennial weeds, things like um, Canada thistle and 
some of those other uh, problem perennials, kind of the thistle, um, horse nettle, et cetera. Oftentimes, several tillage operations are needed to effectively manage weeds if you're not including other methods of weed control, uh, like cover crops or even herbicides. Um, be careful, uh, especially when you're doing uh, in-row cultivation, tillage can damage crop roots. Tillage can, constant tillage can also cause, you know, soil erosion and compaction, which is how, why we see this picture here on the right hand side, of uh, you know, the dust bowl back in the 1920s. Uh, now moving on to some more modern weed control tactics, um, thermal weed control. Uh, this tactic has been practiced for centuries. Uh, for example, you know, the Native Americans used to burn plains for grazing grasses and fire is just a natural part of any, um, of many ecosystems. So with thermal weed control, what we're looking at is using some type of flame or torch or infrared radiation. Pros of using thermal weed control, you know, you're using fire. So it's going to instantaneously rupture the cell walls, causing rapid desiccation. You can be precise and you're not disturbing the soil like you would be if you were tilling and you're not using any herbicides. Now, the cons of using uh, thermal weed control uh, basically stem from, you know, the weeds may be too, let, be too wet to light on fire. Also, it's important to remember that some weeds and some crops especially have a thick cuticle that may provide them some protection. You know, some plants have growing points that are actually protected from heat damage, and some plants just have that natural tissue that's able to tolerate heat. You know, for example, flame weeding can be very effective in corn when it's less than one inch tall, because it's grow that growing point is underground and it's actually surrounded by developing leaves. However, you know, after flame weeding is done, after that corn reaches about the five leaf stage, that heat should be directed below that crop canopy so you're not burning off your leaf tissue. Flame weeding is gonna be more effective on the those smaller weeds versus larger weeds. More of the fire is going to touch those weeds. Uh, flaming is also going to only kill those above ground structures. It's, you might burn back a perennial weed, but it still has you know, that tap root for, from which you know, it can still emerge. Again, going back to that crop stop tolerance and stage tolerance, uh, don't, generally don't have to worry about flaming in corn when it's smaller larger corn, those flames need to be directed. And of course, you know, flint using any type of fire to control weeds does create a hazard. There's also the issue with the increased cost of using propane, which is about five to eight to five dollars an acre. But then you combine that with the need to add, um, put diesel fuel in your tractor and drive across the field. Um, multiple times to control, you know, those emerged weeds. Now, electrical uh, weed control, kind of the same concept of flame weeding, except, you know, with electrical weed control, what you're doing is you're sending a jolt of energy through a, to a target weed. An example, example here, this is the uh, weed zapper electrical weed control unit. This is set up with a generator on the back of the tractor and you have an electric bar right here that actually comes in contact with the weeds in order to zap them. Now the, pro uh, the pros, again, you're sending an electrical jolt through the plant. As you're sending that jolt through the plant, the natural resistance in that plant is actually going to create heat in that plant, which causes the desiccation in those cells. And that's why it's similar to flame weeding, except with electrical weed control, that electricity can travel all the way down to the roots and potentially have better control of perennial plants. Another good thing about electrical weed control, it is actually 
more effective on taller plants. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, a lot of herbicides will only work when weeds are small, but with electrical uh, weed control, um, as plants grow larger, they're gonna be grow kind of above that crop canopy. So there's enough of a height difference between your crop and your weed where that um, bar is coming into contact with those weeds is gonna be much more effective in controlling the, those weeds um, compared to a rescue application of a, of a particular herbicide. Now, some of the cons with electrical weed control, like, like um, general flame weeding, plant moisture has a lot to do with the, its effectiveness. You know, if, if there's higher plant moisture, you're gonna see reduced control. Um, overall soil moisture is also gonna affect how well this process works. If you have a lot of soil mo moisture, Gonna, it's going to take more electricity going through that bar to actually effectively control these plants. Now, <clears throat> electrical weed control is also not as effective on woody plants or, or grasses. You know, for woody plants, it's kind of like having that bark that's a little bit more tolerant to the heat. And with grasses, it just more of has probably has to do with the physiology of the plants you're coming into more contact with more leaf surface rather than stem tissue, which will affect how the electricity travels through the plant. Also with electrical weed control, you may need multiple passes. Uh, a recent study that, that just came out on using uh, this method showed that, you know, for weeds like, you know, uh, common water hemp, which is a relative of Palmer amaranth, we saw better control when um, these plants were shocked twice rather than and just once. And as with any um, electrical or flame weeding tactic, there is that human safety issue and it can create a fi fire hazard. So uh, just an aside, we have all these different weed control mechanisms. Um, you may be worried about being poisoned by herbicide, but we also have electrical weed control, um, which you know you might be have a fear of being electrocuted. So you know none of these weed control tactics are without their inherent problems. And the last uh, weed control tactic I'll mention, or second to last, will be you no know, actually using herbicide. And we've already kind of discussed some of the pros and con cons of these herbicides. You know. They target a particular plant physiology. I mean, they reduce their need for hand weeding. And like you know, that thermal weed control, the electrical weed control, they're much better for soil conservation because they're not disturbing any of that soil layer or that organic matter. Now the crop, the cons being, you know, you have to select your particular herbicide for your particular crop. Um, environmental conditions can influence herbicide uptake and effectiveness. You know, for example, if those pre-emergence herbicides I showed earlier, if you don't get any rainfall to actually leach that into the, uh, the treated zone, that herbicide is not going to be effective. You also have the issue you know, with you know, herbicide drift on the non-target species. And with herbicides, more than one application is usually required for management. And again, we have that whole issue with herbicide resistance. So it's just some basic steps for a good herbicide program. Um, like your prevention, you always want to start clean using tillage or an effective burn down treatment. You also want to use multiple effective pre-emergence residual herbicides at planting. And scout fields your fields after you've applied your herbicide treatments, whether it's a pre-emergence herbicide or that post-emergence herbicide to see if it's actually working. And then make timely post applications. Timely post applications would be when the weeds are small and that crop canopy hasn't closed. Weeds are again below or under three to four inches tall, not when the crop canopy is closed and, you, and you're seeing weeds above 
the canopy uh, like a lot of the Palmer Amaranth and Mare's Tail I've seen this past season. Also, when you make your post-emergence treatments, you want to include a residual herbicide, one of those soil active herbicides, something like, say, a dual or a warrant for, to prevent further weed germination. Because basically, when you do your herbicide application, your pre-emergence herbicide application, even though you might not have any weeds in the field, you're only going to get about four weeks of control out of that pre-emergence herbicide. Your crop canopy is not going to develop in about four weeks. But if you, when you spray that post-emergence herbicide uh, about maybe two to three weeks after you sprayed your pre-emergence herbicide and apply that residual herbicide on, that's going to give you kind of an overlapping control to allow you know, that herbicide to continue treatment to continue to work until that crop canopies. And again, uh, be sure to keep scouting your field and make applications as necessarily, necessarily and as allowed by the particular herbicide label. And be sure to rotate these herbicides with uh, different crops. There are a lot of herbicides that can be used in corn that can't necessarily be used in soybean and vice versa. And we want to talk about rotating with herbicides with different crops and using multiple effective sites of action. Remember all those different herbicide groups I talked about earlier, you know, your photosynthetic inhibitors, your ALS inhibitors, uh, fatty acid, all these different herbicide groups. When you talk about using multiple effective sites of action, you're going to use more than one herbicide and ideally different herbicides from different herbicide groups in, in your pre-emergence and your post-emergence uh, weed control program. Another thing I wanna mention about um, using uh, herbicides are the different tolerance traits. Um, for the past you know, 20, 26 years, we've had Roundup Ready beans, which allow us to spray Roundup over the top of the crop um, and kill the weeds with act without actually hurting the crop. Now that we have herbicide resistant weeds, like common ragweed, like Palmer amaranth, like mare's tail, I don't like to see people pl planting Roundup Ready beans. Because what happens is, they, they'll end up with one of those resistant weeds. Fortunately, now with the traits we're seeing in corn and in soybeans, we have a stack traits, which allow us to apply different herbicides, multiple herbicide uh, groups over the top of the crop without hurting it. For example, the Enlist E3 system allows us to apply 2,4-D, uh, glyphosate, Roundup, or glufosinate, Liberty. Three different modes of three different sites of action to control these weeds. Extend the max allows us to apply dicamba in addition to glyphosate and glufosinate over the top of the crops. Now, not only do these stack traits allow us to give us a little bit more versatility of what we can apply, these stack traits also allow us to apply different herbicide, these herbicides in tank mixtures. For example, I've seen over the past couple of years. Um, when controlling herbicide resistant common ragweed, uh, the combination of 2,4-D and glufosinate or Liberty or Enlist-1 and uh, Liberty um, really does a great job of controlling these weeds. It provides um, a, a kind of a symbiotic uh, synchronetic effect on controlling these weeds. And again, you're using two effective sites of actions for controlling these herbicides. Now, the last thing I wanna mention is, is harvest weed seed control. And this is something that's been researched in um, particularly in Australia and is uh, kind of being uh, a hot topic here in the United States. And, and harvest weed seed control basically deals with what do we deal, how do we do with, deal with the seeds in our, uh, the weeds in our field that have actually produced seeds. Um, so, you know, it's about harvest time and we see something like Palmer amaranth 
common rag when you have a lot of mature seed that still attach these plants at harvest. Now, unfortunately, what happens is as you harvest, these mature seeds are going to be spread by the combine and you're actually going to have a much higher population of your resistant weeds the next year. So harvest weed seed control is basically, you know, how do we manage this crop res residue? Um, these can be different tactics by, um, like chaff lining, um, managing the weed containing chaff, um, putting in carts, or actually managing the weed seed containing chaff uh, via impact mills. Now chaff lining is probably the cheapest option for herbicide uh, harvest weed seed control right now. And this is just some uh, simply a modification on the tractor that uh, funnels the chaff uh, and the weed seeds into narrow rows. So, you know, so that, slight, that slight modification, just, you know, simple fun, uh, metal funnel on the tractor is going to allow that all that chaff and weed seed at harvest time to be concentrated into a particular area. Now, the pros of that being, you know, as the weeds are on the ground in that chaff line, they're gonna be exposed to those natural elements such as uh, rain, water, and seed predation that can lead to seed decay. And these weeds are also concentrated into a particular area. So if you, uh, your management program next year, instead of focusing on a broadcast application over the entire field, you may be able to focus on more of a banded application over those uh, narrow rows of chaff to help manage the weeds. And some places, uh, depending on what the regulations are at the time, can also burn that chaff line. Again, just really depends on whether, if you're in that time of the summer or time of the fall when you're actually allowed to uh, set something on fire. And the con, of course, being, you know, those weeds still need to be managed either with that, you know, banded herbicide application or, or uh, by burning them. Chaff carts, a little more ex expensive. Instead of actually dropping that weed seed containing chaff behind the combine, the weed seeds are actually collected in a cart and removed from a field. Um, it is much simpler than the putting in a narrow wind rose and burning those wind rows because you are effectively removing it from the field and you don't really need that any additional specialized equipment except for the cart itself. Now the cons mean you might need a little bit of modification for this setup. Um, you also have the uh, added size and weight of pulling you know that cart through the field and you also have the issue of how where and how do you empty that weed seed containing chaff from the cart. Um, one of the more promising things that have been studied for harvest weed seed control has actually been impact mills. Um, and these are actually mechanical systems that actually grind that weed seed containing chaff. So it's uh, basically a cage mill. That chaff will enter that cage mill um, we've got some rotors and stationary bars, and that'll actually grind up that weed seed. Pros being, you no, know, it destroys at least 96% of the weed seed that actually reaches, you no, know, that cage mill. Cons being, um, this does require a specialized equipment. Uh, there are several companies producing cage mills out on the market, one of them being the integrated Harrington seed destructure. Um, there's also a unit called a Redicop that, uh, that's a cage mill. You also have to worry about you know, the size and weight of that extra equipment when you're harvesting. Um, it's going to cause a greater engine load and greater fuel, fuel consumption when you're running th these mechanisms. You also have, can have the extra uh, the issue of clogging where, you know, that some of that plant material is getting into that cage mill and it's not working properly. Also, with harvest weed seed control and these impact mills, you know, weeds really need to retain their seed at harvest. For something like uh, Palmer amaranth, it's going to retain 
uh, over 95% of its seeds. So a lot of it's gonna be able to be destroyed by that cage mill system. Um, something like common ragweed, that's gonna re only retain about 88 or 80% or of its seeds at harvest time. You'll get some har harvest weed seed control with that species, but not as much as you would with something that's gonna hold on to its seed at harvest. Also, it's important to remember that, you know, 100% of a seed doesn't make it through to that um, uh, cage mill. Um, this, can be, this can be attributed to, you know, just some of the seed being knocked off by the combine head and some of the seed being lost in thresher. Other top tactics for harvest weed seed control that aren't as advanced, but still definitely need to be applied are, you know, hand pulling those escaped weeds when you can, especially things like Palmer amaranth. Another good tactic is to harvest your infested fields last. You know, you wanna harvest all your clean areas of your field and your clean fields first, and then come back and harvest areas, fields that have, you know, these uh, problem weeds, these herbicide resistant weeds. Also, be sure to clean your equipment before moving into other fields. Um, Palmer amaranth has very small seeds. If you harvest a field with Palmer amaranth and you move to a clean field, that field will have Palmer amaranth in it next year. So three basic steps for har harvest weed seed control. I mean, a lot of it's still being uh, researched, but it's really up to you to decide which system fits your farm best. Um, it's really important to get the maximum amount of weed seed into that he header so it's traveling through the combine and it's being placed in those chaff rows or it's reaching that cage mill. Also, have a plan for what are you gonna do with your collected weed seed, especially when you're doing like the chaff lining or, or those chaff carts. The cage bill is pretty much going to cr crush your, your weed seed, but again, got to manage um, that remaining residue in the field. Some additional resources I uh, always like to point people to are our Mid-Atlantic Weed Management Guide. This is um, a guide we produce for um, crops such as corn, soybean, wheats, uh, sorghum, as well as pasture and CRP ground. Um, this guide is exclusively uh, uh, herbicide related, uh, gives some good information about what herbicides are effective on what weeds, a little bit of information on herbicide resistance uh, for both uh, pre-emergence weed control and post-emergence weed control. Another good resource is this. Uh, this is managing weeds on your farm. Um, just Google it. This is available as a free uh, PDF um, from the SARE website. Um, this uh, this del delves more into some of the, uh, the integrated weed management strategies I talked about, some of the ecological strategies you can rely on in addition to a herbicide program to, to give you better weed control. And finally, uh, the uh, GROW website. Uh, this is getting rid of weeds through integrated weed management. GROW is a uh, nationwide cooperative of weed management researchers. It's constantly being updated with research and new methods for uh, integrated weed management tactics, such as the harvest weed seed control stuff I mentioned earlier. And with that, I will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, my contact information is below my phone number, email address, or you can uh, follow me on Twitter at MD Ag Weeds. Right. Thank you, Kurt. Does anyone have any questions for Kurt? Give me a few minutes. Okay. I don't see anything yet. Wait a few more minutes, but just make sure you uh, take his information so that you can ask questions if you need to. Um, and certainly you will get a recording. So if you don't have his information yet, you'll get the recording 
uh, in the email and you can uh, check it out and, and get in contact with them if you would like. So thank you so much, Kurt. I appreciate it. And uh, everyone have a good rest of your day and uh, enjoy this uh, super warm weather, at least here, super warm weather. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.